Hello and welcome to a capsule. That's right, this is my office hours capsule where I record a small segment of my live stream which happens on Thursdays at 6 p.m. Eastern, I'm sorry, 6 p.m. Pacific, 8 p 9 p.m. Eastern on twitch.tv slash theastropub and youtube.com slash theastropub where I kind of hang out and talk with the community about Star Citizen lore and news and all sorts of things. As you can tell by the title and you can tell by the thumbnail if you're watching this video, I'm going to be talking about the letter from the chairman. Now, this is going to be a weird thing for me to say because I usually do some stuff like this for, say, the monthly report. And I don't usually say this because, generally speaking, what I read on a monthly report is pretty much what you got. Read the, the letter from the chairman. I know you're listening to me read this, which is fine. But after this, at some point, make the time to read it. This is a very long document. It's 6,600 plus words. This is not a letter. This is an essay. All right? This is, this is like a tenth of a novel that Chris wrote. So it's going to take you some time. And it's going to take me some time, as you can see by the timeline. But I'm going to do my best to read it word for word. Interject here, here and there with my own kind of intake to kind of explain what's being discussed about or put my own my own spin on things, but I'm going to read it. So this is not a summary. This is a, this is going to be a complete one-to-one -one read through, which I think is still valuable because a lot of people just don't have time to read that stuff. But even then, after you've listened to me or watched me uh, do this, go back and read it, please. My only, my only caveat. That being said, let's get started. All right, letter from the chairman. This was released on May 18th, 2022 at 1 p.m. Don't drive angry. Phil Collins, uh, Phil, Phil Connors, Bill Murray, Groundhog Day, 1993. In some ways, last year felt like we were stuck in the middle of a Bill Murray in Groundhog Day, repeating the same cycles as 2020. Just as we thought we were seeing the light at the end of the tunnel with COVID-19 pandemic, new variants emerged to send cases skyrocketing again and communities back into lockdown and other safety measures. The world grew increasingly weary and fatigued from the toll of both pandemic and necessary measures to keep people safe as possible. And even as a large part of the world is starting to return to normal, the specter of a new potential variant that can uh, evade the vaccines and is more transmissible haunts us. Hopefully, with the readily available vaccines in most countries and certain degree of built-in protection from prior infections, COVID will continue to transition to an endemic disease. Something we can uh, that can certainly is something that is that certainly is not great, but not nearly as deadly as before. A virus that we can get on with our lives and live just like the common flu or cold. That's just him talking about the trend, like how. COVID has affected the world, which obviously is implying that it affected, affected CIG as well. Because of the ups and downs of last year, we are just starting to get back to the office. The first studio where it became possible to start working together in person at any scale was our UK studio in Manchester, where I have been spending a lot of time since last fall. I've been working with the Squadron 42 team side by side in the office as we focus on finishing and polishing the content and features of what will be an epic narrative adventure. Our offices in Frankfurt, Austin, and Los Angeles are only just starting to return to the office now that the local authorities have deemed it safe enough to lift various requirements. At the beginning of the pandemic, we were proud of how we transitioned seamlessly to work from home environment, but as the situation dragged on, it became clear that we were missing the benefits of spontaneous collaboration and team building that come from working in person near each other. The, other, uh, the time I have spent with Squadron Team in the UK has only reinforced this as the ability to walk over to someone's desk and see the issue or having a conversation and passing about a problem or creative thought makes an enormous difference in, uh, to progress. When everyone is working remotely, it becomes more of a slog to problem solve on the fly or easily get, uh, get or give fee feedback. Uh, and you end up with far more meetings slash video calls. In our internal tracking, we found that we had six times as many meetings when everyone was working from home than we were in the office. I personally felt the difference in our uh, in our release. I personally felt the difference in our release cadence. It took us a little longer to get each patch out than before, and it became harder to solve or fix bugs, which hung around longer than previously. I've also seen the trend in the industry as a whole. 
with pretty much any large title being delayed or in some unfortunate cases released before they should have been. That's... <laughs> all right, Chris, why don't you just say Cyberpunk 2077, all right? It's more, it's more, more classy, but I get it. What are you saying? For this reason, despite our ability to work fully remote, we are focused on getting people back together, working with each other side by side for extended periods. Going back to the office does not mean a return to the old work patterns and policies. As extended lockdowns combined with working remotely for two years has given us new insight into work-life balance for our staff. We've altered our global work policy to allow for flexi hours and a hybrid of, uh, of in-person and work from home, depending on both an employee's and manager's needs, with the emphasis being on uh, uh, being cognizant, I guess, of our employees' life situations. This is good. All right. This is very important, all right? This, what this has mentioned is big because there are many developers out there right now who are forcing developing like their, 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 their teams to go back to studios. And many people are just saying, no. There are many people who are talented artists or engineers who physically, which wouldn't even now, even before the pandemic, couldn't go into work because of um, social anxiety issues or disabilities that they, they suffer. They just couldn't go back into work, go into an office environment. Those people aren't necessarily bad employees or bad at the, with their jobs. So when people who need work-life balance need some flexible time to not have to go into an office, because we live in a, the world we live in, this, uh, you know, they're being flexible with those people. That's a good sign because that means that A, CIG is going to get a lot more candidates as a, as, a, uh, as a result for people who want to work for CIG because that, they have that ability. And B, it also still allows for people to come into the office if they need to. Uh, I know I, I knew somebody who worked for um, Austin, Amazon in Austin, and they talked about how they actually don't have a studio in Amazon. Like they, they don't have a... Um, uh, like a an actual not Amazon Twitch that works Twitch in Austin. There's no Twitch offices in uh, in Austin, but there is a Twitch office in Austin. Uh, the Twitch team who works in Austin works remotely, and once or twice a week they go into rent one of the Amazons or they use one of the Amazon the Austin Amazon like offices. Uh, they're like conference centers, so they they have meetings in person like once or twice a week to discuss and talk things, and then they go back to their, uh, their remote working. This was before the pandemic they were doing that. So this is something that has been possible for many, many long times. So this is good. This is good for employees overall. So like probably no one has talked about that. In fact, of every summary I've seen about CIG, uh, discussing CIG, no one has picked up or discussing the letter from the chairman. No one has picked up on this. So that's a good thing. Uh. <clears throat> Despite the challenges of last year, I am proud of how much we accomplished in 2021. In fact, looking back at the year in review, I'm amazed at the amount of content features we delivered to our players. In January of last, last year, the community was able to play their first iteration of Xenothreat Incursion, our first dynamic event that players, uh, praised, that players praised for bringing together pieces of Star Citizen for a thrilling server-wide encounter. While only our first iteration, this event already showed glimpses of the future promises of the Persistent Universe. In April of 2021, we released Alpha 313, Underground Infamy, and delivered drive-in caves and sinkholes, planet tech improvements, ship-to-ship -ship docking, and more. With Invictus launch week, we opened the doors to the Javelin for the first time and let people take walking tour for the mighty UE Destroyer, and brought the Bengal into orbit to showcase the biggest capital ship in the verse. The ship yet in the verse. However, we really started to hit our stride in the second half of 2021 with the release of Alpha 314, Welcome to Orison, when we finished the Stan uh, Stanton system by launching the gas giant of Crusader and landing zone of Orison, accompanying that were a host of quality of life improvements and our first iteration of volumetric clouds. Then, with Alpha 315, Deadly Quons Consequences, we introduced version zero of our medical gameplay, looting, bombing, and personal inventory, just to name a few new features. Coupled with our continuing improvements in performance and stability, and the drastic reduction in server crashes, which usually manifest themselves as the user to a user as the infamous 30k error, connection lost to the server. Star Citizen, the game, was finally starting to come together in a way that had never been done before, that never had done before. And as great as our 2020 year was in terms of engagement and sentiment, the back half of 2021 was another level. 
we saw more people than ever flocking to join Star Citizen, a flocking to Star Citizen, carried in on waves of goodwill and excitement from current players asking their friends to join, and from complete newcomers awed by the spectacle of Crusader, the gameplay of Xenothreat, and the opportunities from new features like personal inventory and looting. And to cap, it, to cap off the year, we launched Alpha 316 Return to Jump Town. Veteran players returned to see our fresh, new take on the classic Jump Town engagement battlegrounds and were amazed in just how far the game had progressed. Our wins in 2021 set us up for an absolutely historic start for 2022. So far, we've blown past all of our projections and new players joining the verse. In fact, this year, we have more than doubled our rate of new user acquisition, and with the new uh, launch of Alpha 317, Fueling Fortunes, we are seeing over 2,000 new players a day joining the verse. Our DAU, Daily Active Users, has grown over 50% since the numbers I started my last, uh, in my last letter to the chairman, which was back in 2020. In December of 2021, <laughs> And with this uh, latest patch, we are enjoying double the daily login traffic of our last April patch launch. We are enjoying a monthly active users, MAU, which is, uh, which is well beyond the heights of 2020. And we have nearly 1 million new accounts created since then. And more than half a million new pledging players joined the game. And this week, we had our 2 millionth unique player log into Star Citizen. We are on track this year to break 4 million total accounts, over 1 million unique logins this year alone, and more than, I just add the loan, but, and more than 500 million in lifetime revenue. God damn. <laughs> God damn. Um, for, for those of you who don't realize, I, if I remember correctly, and I'll have to go back and look at this, I believe that the daily logins in 2020 was still like 20,000 players on peaks on like weekends or something like that. Which isn't, you know, still impressive. It's not bad, not great, but still impressive. Which is like average, is like 4,000, 5,000 people during the week. But if they double that, that's that's pretty impressive. Uh, that also means that, again, more users means more money. More money means more ability, flexibility for, for CIG. So all this is due to the incredible support we receive from you combined with the progress we've made in Star Citizen, which brings new curious gamers into the verse. It is heartening to see the feedback and impressions from newer members of the community when they first start playing Star Citizen. All right, this is gonna make no sense because, uh, so I'm gonna have to give this context. We were talking about this before I started the recording. We were talking about it on the live stream. Join us live office hours, Thursdays live. Uh, about how CSU can't name things because the Legionnaire, which recently came out, is also the name of the Aurora, an Aurora variant called the Legionnaire. Now CSG keeps doing this, so um, like, it's, it's like feedback and impression from new members of the community. Just, Chris, name name things better, please. <laughs> all right. It's just all good. Uh, all right. For all those who that have uh, been around from the start, it's easy to take granted a lot of the features that Star Citizen has that no other game does. After all, we know every feature, its bugs, and more importantly, what it's not done. What is not done. So it can be easy to focus on the cup half empty rather than full. But what, other game, um, but what other game has the combination of scale and detail, the ability to seamlessly go from on foot to on board a fully realized ship with functioning components and a livable interior you can move around, take off uh, towards twinkling pinprick in the sky, up through the clouds, into the blackness of outer space, only to get interrupted by a group of pirates looking to liberate your cargo from, the, um, from you, um, best them in uh, an intense dogfight, and continue your journey towards a twinkling light in the distance. It becomes another planet. As you can then enter the atmosphere, land on, lower your ramp, walk into the bustling city or a uh, beautiful riverbank nestled in the trees or harvest some alien fruit, all without loading screens and rendered in incredible millimeter detail uh, in either first person or third person. There are, uh, uh, there are other games that have some of these elements, but none that has everything with the level of fidelity that Star Citizen offers. Sorry to do this again, but hate to harp on that, but he's not wrong. I've heard plenty of people who are upset with Star Citizen or, uh, you know, get bogged down in some of the problems, but really, like, go play other games. <laughs> and, and this isn't like a, you're mad, go play another game. No, like, go get some perspective. Like, play 2042, right? 2042, brand new Battlefield game. And then come back and play Star Citizen. Yeah, there are bugs in Star Citizen that are frustrating. Yeah, you can get to the battlefield experience, but are you going to be able to, like, 
load up a truck full of supplies and take it to the front lines or drag somebody back and, you know, you know, get them to surgery. No, it's just not, it's not how Battlefield's designed to do. So Star Citizen is kind of a unique game in that sense. So, so it's always good to keep that perspective and go. And hot dogs don't make you gain weight. Good point. Sometimes it isn't a bad thing to look back and appreciate just how far you've come. We've had a lot of flack for timelines and schedules. Stop giving dates, Chris. Um, especially when the original crowdfunding campaign is brought up. Answer the call 2016, Chris. Uh, but the game is being, being built today is completely different and far more expansive and immersive game than I pitched almost 10 years ago. Back then, there was no fully realized planets rendered to incredible detail that you'd go anywhere on. Planets were only visible if they had crafted a landing uh, had had a crafted landing location, and even then, there's a debate whether we could, they could have had explorable been explored in first person, or they'd have been more like landing zones in Freelance or Privateer, where you could click between a few locations, buy or sell goods, pick up a mission in a bar. There was no con con uh, conception of first person system that is as tactile and fully formed as we're making today, nor a vehicle simulation that had physical components and the level of systematic functionality that we're striving for. The game being built today is a game that encompasses many. It is a dogfighting space sim. It is a first-person shooter. It is a trading game, a resource collecting game, a resource management game, an adventure game, a survival game, and a social game. Star Citizen is a universe sim. It is a game for everyone. As in real life, there are many different paths to walk, and success is defined about what makes you happy. If you want to improve your abilities as a fearsome combat pilot, the game has that for you. But equally, if you just want to quietly mine materials for make your fortune, or hang out in landing zones, or find a corner of the galaxy that no one else has found, all of these options in the sandbox that Star Citizen is are, are, are all of these are options in the sandbox that Star Citizen is. To do this right at the scale that will allow uh, allow millions of people to play together makes takes time and money. And with your support and patience, we are able to build a game that I do not think any other publisher could afford to do or would be crazy enough to commit to. He's not wrong. Star Citizen would be impossible to make by any publisher because they have to answer to investors. And those investors demand returns on their investment. CIG is not doing that. But us who are backers don't give a rat's ass about that. We just want the game. So people will dump more money into it because they want to see this game being made, which is different. Star Citizen would not be made without the current the way it is. That's just the hand, hands down, the way that Star Citizen is being funded, there's just no way it would be made without the current system. It's weird, it's janky, I don't think any other system is going to exist like it, but it just wouldn't exist without this. Whether you like it or not, that's the reality. Um, but I will say that, and I, I, I'd make a joke about Answer the Call 2016, Chris should eat crow? He needs to eat crow. He needs to make a culpa that. You make some bad predictions. You say some things and then you just say it's not happening. You can't do that. You have to explain. You have to give us understanding and explain to us why it would take now from 2016 to question marks for Squadron 42 to come out. You know, all that sort of thing. You need to be more open and honest about it. This is a good start. This is a good part of that. But you're going to get that thrown at you. Just hands up, hands straight up, straight down, or straight up, hands up, straight up, whatever. Straight up, you're going to get that thrown at you every single time you try to say anything. Someone's going to mention that you, you predicted, you said it was released in 2016, and it's been 10 years since 2012. That's just, it's easy. So you have to be a little bit more tactile for that. Personally, I'm much more of a, I get it. You make mistakes, you move on, and I'm not going to hold to someone to, a, uh, to I'm not going to be overly negative towards anybody if they've shown progress since they've made a mistake. Maybe it's just a teacher in me. But I understand also that most people aren't like me. So I'm built different. Uh, <laughs> all right. Many that have financially supported Star Citizen do not care about profits or quarterly earnings. They just want to, the best and uh, biggest game possible, one that lives up to their expectations and dreams. While that is no small task, it is something that is far easier for myself and everyone at CIG to put our effort into as it is a privilege to be challenged artistically and supported financially in this manner. Um, and I am, I am immensely grateful to have so many people to put through, uh, uh, to, 
So many people put so much faith in all of us. Uh, in all of us. Yeah, in all of us. Thank you. That's not done. That's the intro. <laughs> like I said, it's going to be a long one. Um, they don't make dates and promises. You'll see when he mentions about things in the future till the end, the likely it could, could also burn out if it doesn't. Yeah, we'll talk about that here in a moment. Um, all right, the road to 4.0. Back in 2017, December 2017, Alpha, Star Citizen Alpha 3.0 was published to the live server after a unified push from our developers around the globe. This monumental patch introduced a brand new procedural planetary technology and a first planetary bodies you could land on and go anywhere across the surface of the three moons of Crusader. It also introduced a new mission system, improved shop, uh, shopping, new cargo mechanics, and doubled our server player cap. To date, Star Citizen 3, 3.0 was probably the biggest incremental jump in gameplay and content, which is why we, we incremented the alpha design designation from 2.x to 3.x. And it is a whole eight months between uh, 2.6.3 and 3.0. This year, we find ourselves on a similar path with three huge technology innovations that will fundamentally change the experience and immersion into Star Citizen. The first of these is what we are calling the Persistent Entity Streaming, or PES, which is the foundational tech that allows server meshing, SM. PES is the hardest part of the work needed for SM and is the, uh, the one that has required the most engineering. It fundamentally changes how we record the state of the universe and delivers a level of persistence that you just don't see in any other game, in any other games whether they are MMOs or even single player experiences. Up until now, all persistences in the game has been tied to a player's inventory, ships you own, or items you hold physically in the virtual inventories of items you um, in the virtual inventories of items you own. If you're physically attra attached to an item inside your vehicle, say a rifle or weapon rack, when you log out or stow the vehicle, it will remember that it attached items and anything in that vehicle's virtual inventory. However, if you drop that, uh, drop it or place something loosely, even inside a ship you own, it won't be associated with any player inventory. So when you log out or the server crashes, the item will not be there when you log back in or rejoining with PES. We are recording the state of every dynamic object in the game. All right, with PES, we're recording the state of every dynamic object in the game, irrelevant of whether it's owned or held by a player. That means that you could drop a gun or a med pen in a forested area on Microtech. Stop littering the forests, Chris. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Uh... Uh, and returned several days later after locking out to find the gun or med pen still there, assuming another player didn't grab them. <laughs> At least he's not littering with coffee cups anymore. That's true. Now he's going for drugs <laughs> and weapons. <laughs> You're just going to drop fully loaded, loaded weapons in there so that the Boreal stalkers can learn to use them or get high off of drugs. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> uh... The technology to do this at the scale of for a universe as large and detailed as ours for millions of players is no small feat of engineering. We've been working towards this since 2019 when we debuted our server-side object container streaming, or SOX, uh, SSOCS, uh, which allows for uh, ser server to only stream in and simulate only a portion of our universe, which is necessary if you're going to uh, have multiple servers simulate different parts of the universe. Now, this is another important thing. I've heard a lot of people try to throw it back into like, what about SSOCS? It's like, what about SSOCS? It's part of the tools. It's important to remember that as Chris was talking here, that these every part of these tools was part of a larger perspective. SSOCS was never going to be the magic bullet that fixed everything, and CAG never said that. Players often took that to mean other things, and like I've, I will say as well, Server meshing is not going to fix everything. But it probably will improve things. That's what we said about, so uh, uh, about socks. We said it won't fix everything, but it'll probably improve things. Ended up not really improving things. That's a guessing game. And that's mostly on the players, not necessarily the developers. 
So that's our bag because we saw things like client side object container, uh, con container streaming, which had a huge FPS boost and stuff like that. So uh, it's important to keep that into mind that like building a game like Star Citizen requires hundreds of moving parts all working together. Um, you know, an incalculable number of programs that are running in the back end to make things work. Uh, probably calculable, but more than, I, I, I don't know all the de all of the details, and I guarantee you that there's maybe a handful of people at CIG who knows all of them and how they work. Because most people just focus on their sliver of the pie. Uh, all right. The development has not always and not been without road bumps. We had to change our plans for how we would persist the state of the universe when we realized that the backend relational database that we were planning on using with a host of services, which we collectively dubbed iCache, would likely not be able to have low latency at the scale we needed for a number of concurrent players that we'll need to support in the future. We pivot, pivoted using a graph database at the start of 2021, taking a different approach to the services and cache, which we outlined in the virtual presentation during last year's CitizenCon. The current architecture uses what we call a replication layer, which is a scalable data cache that tracks the state of all dynamic objects in the universe, runs in the cloud, and communicates with the cloud-based graph databases, a database, which we call the entity graph. This ultimately is the final authority on the state of all dynamic objects in our universe. The replication layer, which is separate service and in its final form will have multiple worker nodes based on the player concurrency, allows us to track and communicate with the state of the universe in real time and separates the simulation from state. This is especially important for scalability as clients do not need to wait for server to simulate to see the state change around them. As both clients and servers communicate to their results to the replication layer, which is then reflected to all clients. Because the replication layer is a ser uh, service does not need to simulate, it can communicate state changes to clients at a fixed frequency and is not bound to the simulation time, which should lead to a better experience for players. That's a lot of words, and I'm gonna try to do my best to, to, to break this down. Effectively, the server and the player are both reporting to, to the replication layer, who's the authority. And that authority is not simulating the game, it's just tracking the data. And then it is pulling that data and pushing it back to the server and to the clients, other clients. So if I'm flying a ship and I move right, my information is being transmitted to um, the entity graph and the entity graph is then, um, or the, the replication layer, which is then reflecting that back to all of the other clients in the region. Um, I'm sure there's some that it's connecting to the server and the server's bouncing into the entity graph and back and forth. I'm sure there's some connections there as well. But effectively, it is the final authority, but because it doesn't have to simulate the universe, it's just tracking the data, it can just pull that data back to, to let everyone know where everything is. Well, and let the server, the simulation server, simulate the like the physics and all the other things that are gonna happen. So um, that's what they've been planning on doing for a while. But this is just more of a kind of dis like distilled concept of that, where everything is back end, which is uh, like an example of this. You ever logged into a server and like everything in the store is gone? There's just nothing populating in the store. That's because the server is not connecting to the back end. Because the back end controls what's in that store, how much quantity is in that store, what it's being sold at. The, the server doesn't care about that. That's the back end service which is running that. So it that's similar to what what um this is like the, the replication layer is. The replication layer has to be talking to the server to tell them what is where. Without that, the server's not going to tell you where those things are. Okay. Um, and again, I'm not an, I am not technically adept in those sorts of things. This is based off of what I've heard other people say and my own kind of layman's understanding of how this works. Um, to a degree, I'm sure it's not precise. I'm sure someone's going to go, well, actually, Paul, the... The server routes this through the node, which is connected to the wobbly doo, which is then connected to the the Wojak, and then they they all talk together with the Princess Peach, who then reflects the data back there, and then it's very comp it's very simple, really, you know. Whatever the concept is, the back end is going to be more authoritative 
and it, it's really needed to be more robust than what it was been in the past, and now it is. Um, simple. S more simply. Uh, for PES to work both with uh, both work both the entity graph and replication layer need to be functional. <laughs> in terms of authority and state change for entities. In addition, a whole host of online services, there needs to be support for the replication layer or replication layer entity, entity graph. Okay, I, maybe I my, maybe just had a stroke. I don't know. Uh, for PES to work, both entity graph and replication layer need to be functional. In terms of engineering, this was the biggest technical challenge required for a fundamental reworking of how the game handles authority and state changes a uh, change of entities. In addition, a whole host of new online services were needed to support the replication layer and entity graph. Okay, yeah. Um, to support PES, we needed to create 12 new services. That's what I'm talking about. The back end is like 12 of these new services. For server meshing, only four more services are currently planned. So you can see just how much foundational tech for, uh, for server meshing is in um, PES for persistent. Why am I saying that? Persistent entity streaming, PES. There we go. As part of this, we switch to gRPC which is an open source, scalable, Google-sponsored data protocol for online communication. The nice aspect of using tech like this is that it's designed to scale. Just imagine how many concurrent users Google must handle. And there is lots of available third-party tools and code compared to creating an internal custom protocol. Very cool. All this means that getting persistent entity streaming to work would require a bulk of the tech we needed to make server meshing viable. I'm happy to report that after 16 months of extremely focused work by 18 engineers, three dedicated QA, and four producers spread it between CIG and Turbulent, who are managing the backend database in the cloud and its related services, that the team were able to demonstrate persistent entity streaming working last week in our weekly internal persistent universe update meeting. That means persistence works. They have it working. It's done. There's a difference between being done and in-game, though, as we'll, he'll go further, further on. Paul Reindell, a.k.a. Rockstar, our director of engineering for online tech, spun up a server, populated the entity graph so its initial state uh, along with the replication layer, which is essentially an, a memory cache for the universe state slash backend database that exists in the cloud, make sure read slash writes to the database do not bottleneck servers and clients. Then connected a client, placed down a series of small objects like cans on the surface of Aberdeen, along with an 890 jump and an anvil arrow. He then killed the server and the client. The server was restarted. We did not populate the entity graph, uh, which has been previously had, which had been previously seeded in the initial startup, and then connected a client, warped to Aberdeen, and everything was there was there as he placed it. This is a huge milestone as the state of the universe was recorded to the backend database. And then when he restarted the server, it just connected the, to the replication layer, which had initialized itself from the database, the entity graph, and continued with the universe as the state he left it in. This means if you have a 30K and the server crashes, when you're calling your big load of, of Quantanium, when you get back on, you will be where you were left, left off. Maybe a couple of seconds behind, maybe a minute behind, depending on when the last read state was, when the last information was sent out was but you will not be gone away. Like right now, when you crash in a 30K, you may get you may get a heartbeat or you, you end up back at the last station you were at with the last save state, but that may be before or after you've purchased stuff or whatever. There, there may be some, some, some gameplay loss. This is that aspect that prevents you from losing. Basically, like the, the heartbeat defangs, defang 30Ks, uh, this is going to kill it. 30Ks will just not be, they'll just be an error code. They won't matter other than time loss uh, in the near future when this is done. So with this, 30K is dead. <laughs> Long live PES, slayer of 30Ks. Um, that may not sound revolutionary to some of you, but I can tell you it, it, it was akin to Neil Armstrong taking one small step. Once persistent entity streaming comes online, Star Citizen will be a different universe. 
Full persistence will provide over uh, uh, over the coming years an experience in gaming that most other online games do not provide. A universe that you can escape to that is affected by you and other players' actions, with the state being dynamic and persistent. Crash land on a planet, and you and your shipwreck will persist while you forage for food or water to survive, and perhaps wood to make a fire to keep warm. Log off, come back to what you built, or perhaps once you've been rescued, another player will stumble onto the wreck of your old ship and the long extinguished campfire, find you the corner of galaxy, uh, find a corner of your galaxy to make your own, collect resources and import material to build your outpost, decorate or arrange your hangar or home how you like. With this tech in place, server meshing becomes possible. As the replication layer slash entity graph is the universe state that clients and servers write and read from. I have been saying that. Gin and Tonic has been saying that. Persistence, and a lot of people have been saying this, persistence is the key to server meshing. I said this back in January. The very first office hours I did this year, I said, persistence is what matters. When and where persistence drops will determine when server meshing drops. This is just a reflection of that. Okay. Uh, if I remember correctly, does server meshing also equal pyro? Yes. I'm also checking the stuff like this. All right. Da, 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 da. Because they have we have de um, decoupled state from simulation, this allows us to have many server nodes all communicating with the replication layer responsible for simulation of focused areas in the universe, which allows us to scale our ability to simulate the overall universe as a server is no longer responsible for every non-player entity, regardless of location or number. This means that instead of a server dropping to five frames per second due to simulation load, we can just spin up another and then another to spread out the simulation load to keep the update tick at high, a tick high rate. This is the ultimate goal of dynamic server meshing and what we are working towards. So it's important to remember that dynamic server meshing is not what we are getting initially. It is the end goal. Now a fundamental change to how the state, uh, now a fundamental change to how state is recorded, especially with uh, one that affects every dynamic object is uh, not just a select few is going to have a lot of edge cases and issues we have to come across, uh, we've yet to come across or yet or foresee. 2022 testing and release cadence. This is where the oof comes in. Because of this, we are going to be approaching 318 differently than our previous releases. We are anticipating that 318 will require a much longer time in Evocati and PTU phases than our previous releases due to the fundamental change in how the uh, game tracks state. We know we will need testing at scale. As our, uh, in, in our experience, we see different issues when we go from internal testing to Evocati to PTU Wave 1, then Wave 2, and so on. Players do crazy things, and a lot of players creates a lot of crazy cases we had not considered, which exposes bugs and edge cases. You underestimate my ability to break things, Chris. That's an expanse quote. Uh, <laughs> uh, our guess is that it may not be long. It may, it may be it might it may be as long as three months in the PTU stage. <laughs> Go get the push trolleys. <laughs> oh God. Captain Burke's challenge accepted. 
It's hard to make uh, anything foolproof because fools are so ingenious. Um, you, you, you can try to make something idiot proof, but the universe always makes a better idiot. Uh, <laughs> Uh, our guess is that it may be as long as three months in PTU stage, but it's hard to predict. For instance, will the universe turn into a nightmare version of WALL-E because everyone just throws empty boxes on the ground? Yes. Or dumps a 10 AI bodies they have looted in New Babbage Commons? 10? Those are rookie numbers, Chris. Up! Have you not, have you not seen what we do to entire bunkers full of, full of like, AI? It looks, it looks like some sort of gibbering madman, like... It looks like something out of a Geiger, you know, picture. <laughs> some some grim dark shit. We're making it rain in 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 uh, the commons of New Babbage. It's going to be a corpse pile. That's all it's going to be. Do not underestimate us. <laughs> He's calling me out with that body quote. Maybe. <laughs> Uh, we are working on what we call a density manager to manage the objects that get recorded and clean up the lower priority ones. For instance, discarded empty boxes or cans when too many are in one area. But I suspect we'll also have to implement AI janitors and perhaps even crime sets for littering in landing zones like New Babbage or Art Corp. I get all of the janitor memes that have been going around on uh, on Twitter now. <laughs> AI janitors. <laughs> uh, I, I also suspect that this is sort of a joke. I don't think Chris is fully saying that. <laughs> Crime set for littering. Oh, let me, let me, let me see if I come out. Hold on. Two seconds. Two seconds. Right? <laughs> That's what Hurston's gonna look like. <laughs> Littering? Uh, all right. As it did not make much sense to engineer the revamped physical cargo system and salvage for the old system, these two features have been engineered for PES. You want wrecks from player battles to stick around so you can salvage them. And that will arrive with 318. However, we do not want engagement and content to stall because PES requires longer testing. So we're planning to release content rich alpha 317.2 patch with known stable code, new missions, new locations, and other gameplay in late June. The vast majority of players, hundreds of thousands of them in fact, are here to simply play on live. And for them, we want to keep them giving, keep giving them engaging new gameplay and adventures to enjoy simultaneously while we test 318 at scale on the PTU. The goal will to give them uh, will be then to get two to three months of testing on Alpha 315, 318 in PTU. Uh, for an Alpha 318 release to live in late Q3. For those who don't know, that's about October. September, October is when that is. I know many of you have been waiting for salvage, persistent, physicalized cargo, cargo and physicalized energy, persistent energy stream for a long time, and I'm excited to see us in the home stretch to finally bring it to you. I think 318 will be an amazing update. That is an even bigger game changer than 315 was. But we will we want to make make sure we give it the proper time to test so we can deliver it to you at the best quality possible. Alongside of persistent streaming work, the engine and graphic teams have been making great progress on the second big technical innovation we've been working on the past two years. A complete replacement of our graphics engine with what we call Gen 12 which is a multi-threaded and much more efficient approach to rendering, which gets most of our modern graphics APIs like, uh, or gets the most out 
of modern graphics APIs like Vulkan. This allows us to utilize the modern graphics power of PCs more efficiently and not tie up the main engine update loop with, uh, with waiting around for draw calls, submissions, and the like. We are looking at getting the bulk of this functionality for the live release of 3.18 with, uh, with the release of Vulkan functionality a little later, but hopefully by the end of the year. This leaves us with our third technical innovation an initiative, server meshing. All right, so I'm gonna break this down so it just makes you understand. 318 is coming out probably in July or June. So next month or in the month of that, into Evocati. I can almost guarantee you it is going to be a dumpster fire of dumpster fires in Evocati. It will probably not even fucking launch for the first week. They'll release it to Evocati and no one can even get in the goddamn game for like two weeks. And then when they do, it will break and crash every five seconds. They'll have to reset the database. They'll have to do all sorts of crazy things because we're just going to hit it with sledgehammers because we're gremlins. Uh, <laughs> and eventually, probably July, August, I would say mid-August, you're going to see it go into PTU. And then probably a month in PTU. So mid-September, we'll go into wave two, which will then go into a free-for-all for like the end of September, early October around CitizenCon, and it'll go... They'll, they'll, they'll do their citizen con thing and they'll say it's it's released so 318 is released so is 318 delayed yes but actually no but yes but no which makes sense and and this is the reason why i say read the whole freaking thing because if we're not like the fact that i've gone through this all you get the context because if i just said 318 is not coming out until um september there's going to, I guarantee you, there's somebody who's going to get really fucking angry about that. But hearing that whole context of why that is, and it's not really just coming out in November or like uh, October, or no, September, September, October, November, it's actually September, October. It's coming out uh, like in July. <laughs> it's just not going to be available for everyone in July. Avocado here can confirm it won't be fun for our, our, our uh, but our glorious suffering will bring us closer to the end goal. Uh, Goki, uh, as as a former ish uh, uh, um, I will say we we bleed, but it's fun because we like hitting things with sledgehammers. The, the weirdest fucking bugs are discovered in Evocati, and we exploit the shit out of them <laughs> for for shit funds. Someone start ordering pizza for our avocado testers. They're going to need it while testing the dumpster fire. Yeah. Um, we, all, we all really need to get used to the idea that 3318 PTU is crucial for us to test and put through its paces. Exactly. That's basically it. It's going to be fun. The important part about this whole thing, and this is why I'm you know also interacting with chat and talking with y'all who are interested in the recording, is that this is going to take some time. If you were around for the 3.0 testing or even the 2.0 testing, you know what I'm saying. Like, it took a while for some of that stuff to get online. But we still were able to watch it on Twitch. We were able to test it. Like, probably come August, you'll probably be able to see all this stuff happening live on Twitch. You may not be able to play it, but you'll be able to see it. And you'll see it through leaks and other things, and CIG will talk about it, and they'll show it off on Star Season Live and all sorts of things. So they'll have, you'll be updated with, about it. It's just you won't be able to play it. You don't want to play it until it goes to live anyway, so it's fine. <laughs> QA breaks the game for money. Evo breaks because they enjoy the challenge, the carnage. Evo breaks because we're psychopaths. Um, all right. Now, the server meshing. This is where things get even juicier. This is actually something that I would hope they do more of, and this is, I'll explain here in a moment. As you might have guessed, we will approach server meshing in much the same way uh, that we are rolling out persistent entity streaming. Star Citizen Alpha 4.0 will be a truly new era in Star Citizen. It will mean our final tech build block, server meshing, will have been delivered. The first implementation, what will be called Static Server Meshing, or SSM, where each server is given a defined area to simulate, but as soon as, as SSM is stable, we will move towards Dynamic Server Meshing, with subsequent releases, which will allow much more scalability as servers will not be bound by a location, but instead be distributed by load. 
allowing for much better simulation performance in any given area of the universe. With 4.0, we will get our second star system, Pyro, which will begin the process of adding more and more content gameplay and polish to get, to get us to beta. He said beta. <laughs> so 4.0 is not beta, but it's getting us to beta. For all of us at CIG, server meshing and 4.0 represent taking that next big leap into populating the verse with a promise of content and gameplay that will turn Star Citizen into the rich, living universe that exceeds the promise we set before those, uh, those many years ago. Our current goal is to introduce server meshing and 4.0 as an early technical preview to Evocati testers in PTU at the end of Q4 this year allowing our most ardent players to help us test, uh, start testing server meshing so we can refine and polish it for release. But this is heavily conditional on how well slash easy the persistent energy streaming, rolling, roll, streaming roll goes out. So be warned, this is a high chance of slipping into Q1 of next year. Once server meshing starts to see real world testing with thousands of players in PTU, we will get a better idea of how much time we'll need to cook in PTU before we can make it make its way to live. We're aiming for the end of Q1 2023, but again, we really do, will not know with confidence until it hits testing. This special 2022 release cadence will not be particularly unusual to most players. If you pull back and look at the, in the broad sense, we still have four big end quarter uh, releases, as well as two big mid quarter releases for Fleet Week in May and IE November. Players who are not step steeped in our development process will still enjoy the experience of rapid content release every quarter. And as we get into the second half of 2022, you will see more meaningful gameplay making its way into the verse, with another run of Xenothreat, updates to Jumptown, new dynamic events, additional locations, and points of interest to explore, and more patch updates. Uh, there will be no shortage of gameplay and content to experience. And by year's end, players will be able to enjoy persistent streaming, salvage cargo refactor, and Bounty Hunter version 2 gameplay on live. Meanwhile, those of you who are following our development closest and providing the critical uh, service of helping us test our biggest tech will be able to get their hands on persistent streaming and server meshing this year, as we put them into test 3.18 and 4.0 in PTU during the summer and winter, respectively. Sometimes we, the wait can be the hardest when we are the closest to the finish line. But this year, I'm excited to share our release plans for our key tech building blocks. And I know many of you cannot wait to jump into the PTU and start testing late this, later this year. All right, so the rest of the stuff that I'm going to go over, I am going to go over it, but I do want to kind of, again, pull aside. I apologize for pulling to the side for those of you who are watching this on, on YouTube, but I think it's very important to keep a lot of this in context and continue to talk about this. Effectively, what we are going to see is 317.2 replacing 318 for the summer release with a closed summer testing starting in June, July, going into August, and then a release for a quarter three for 318. Because... And this is where I'm going to praise Jake and the team and the community team for doing this. And I know this was Jake's big ba bag. This was his whole concept. Um, Y'all would be losing your fucking minds if 3, 319 was scheduled and 4, uh, 320 was scheduled with some various bullshit that they had no idea was going to make it or not, but they wanted to populate it with ideas of what they're going to do. And then Chris got this and then just suddenly tore all that to pieces. Some of y'all would be losing your fucking minds and crying all over Spectrum and, and Reddit about broken promises and shit. But they didn't do that because they were smart enough to say, we're only going to show you for the next patch release because we want to make sure we know what we can give you. This is an example. I am a lot more hyped and I know the community is a lot more hyped about this because they weren't expecting something else for 318, 319, and 4.0, or 319, 320. So, like, I'm just gonna lay that out there. Y'all, y'all, y'all need to apologize to Jake. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> um, and I am not, I don't care if that's controversial. Y'all need to apologize to Jake. A lot of you do. Not necessarily everyone who's watching it, but you know who you are. <laughs> uh, 
but it does mean that 318, so we're still going to get a patch spring or summer, fall, and winter. Um, I think he's also implying, because he said this, this is the important part. We're going to get something in PTU for 4.0. I wouldn't be surprised if we got a 318.1 instead of a late winter patch, which is fine. But I'm going to be controversial. <laughs> Hashtag blame Jake. I'm going to be controversial. I think this release schedule is a lot better than anything they've done so far. I don't care if it's like big tech. Having longer PTUs is better than having shorter. And having the PTU staggered so that you effectively release a release and then the other release is already done and in testing so that you can test it for three months and then release it there. And in the meantime, you, you know, get the other thing ready to test. And then, you know, that sort of staggering of, of like, well, not staggered development, but staggered releasing, I guess you could say, I think is a far better uh, way of doing the game because it'll get a lot more people like dialed into what the game is and give them more immediate feedback. I'm also a big proponent of removing the quarter four patch because I think the quarter four patch is pointless other than just a technical fix patch. You know, maybe a few smaller items to, sprinkled in here and there if they're getting getting them done, but like bug fixes and tightening because that's better than trying to promise or trying to do something when you know your gut, you know your team has to go to on vacation for three weeks. They're planning a bunch of things. They got kids, they got family. Just let them go. <laughs> just just give a small working patch and, and then let them go on vacation. We're all we're all okay with it as long as the quarter three patch is nice. So staggered testing instead of staggered development. Yeah, exactly. All right. So now back on to CIG as a company. It's easy to uh, to only focus on our development progress and the line we, are, we, we have ahead in building Star Citizen and Squadron 42, but there's another very important element to our journey that is often overlooked. Not only are we building two hugely ambitious games to rival anything released by the biggest AAA studios, Chris, you're Ego is showing again, <laughs> but I mean, hey, confidence. Uh, but we've had we've had to build the company to build the technology and make the game from scratch at the same time. The day I stepped out onto the stage at GDC, we had no formal employees. The three founders in Ortwin, Sandy, and myself, and a handful of people who would help, like Forrest Stefan, David Haddock, and David Swafford, sometimes moonlighting as their, uh, from their day job, with permissions, of course, uh, like Ben Lesnick. Haynes uh, Appel, Sean Tracy, and Paul Rindell, and a few friends from my old origin in Digital Anvil days like Sergio Rosas and the CG Bot Art Outsourcing Company to create the demo and build the website. Today, we have 780 people on staff. Let me count this again. So that's three, four. Let's just say 20 people, 11 people plus CG bot. That's what they start off with. 2012, they had 11 people. So that's the context as well. When I hear people say, Star Citizen has been in development for 10 years. There was 11 people, not even full-time employees <laughs> working at, Star at CIG in 2012. That is not a game development studio. That's, that's, a, that's a startup. <laughs> so but now they have 780 people. Uh, plus an extended family of 130 working closely with us at Turbulent. So that's a total of 910 employees. I, I'd have to look up a thing. That's, that's rivaling big publishers. Like that's like, that might be rivaling Activision or Blizzard in terms of like just sheer number of employees. Maybe I'm overestimating this, but this is definitely more than most small double A AA or triple A titles. Um, with many more to join us in the coming months, we have a seven a seven person global talent acquisition team that focuses exclusively on trying to hire the best talent possible for CIG. To give you an idea of the scale of TA work. They've helped us hire 168 people in 2021, and so far this year. We have they've helped us recruit 120 people already. 
In 2022, we will continue to grow in all departments, increasing our headcount to approximately 400, 840, and bring us closer to release uh, for Squadron for Star Citizen and Squadron 42. One challenge we have been facing is that we have nowhere near enough room at several of our studios for new hires that joined us during the pandemic. Because of this, we signed long-term leases on two offices in brand new and uh, state-of-the-art buildings in Manchester and Frankfurt last year. Uh, 9,500 at Activision. Okay, so yeah, that's it's definitely not up there. But uh, like when I think of like a m small to mid-sized studio, I'm thinking like Bethesda. But Bethesda has, I think, 600 people. Even if you add like Arcane and all the other groups and id, I think it's still like 700 people at most. At last I looked, like Bethesda Game Studios, like the like the Zeninax company that was purchased by Microsoft was less than 800 people. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Alcinor. Our um, uh, Red Dead Redemption 2 took 10 years with around 1,000 devs working on it when they already had the technology built. Yeah. Small to mid-size is 300 people. Small studio can be less than 1,100, yeah. Uh, and I'll tell you this, the reason why Manchester and Frankfurt are getting new studios is because the government tax breaks. Austin has not given CIG any tax breaks, which is stupid because they gave tax breaks to fucking um, Tesla, but not to game studios. Fucking serious. Uh, <laughs> they need to. I live in Austin, for those you who don't know, so our government's kind of weird. Sometimes it's great, sometimes it's really dumb, so... Often, more often than not, it's dumb than good. I work for the government, I can tell you. <laughs> uh, uh, and LA, there's no way they're getting a better studio in LA. <laughs> that thing is too expensive. But they've got tax breaks in Manchester and, and in Frankfurt from things like e, uh, probably the city of Manchester, probably this, the uh, uh, UK government. And for Frankfurt, they definitely have EU uh, support, probably German support, and probably Frankfurt support, just because they want more people. So... Uh, they are look at, we're looking at new studios for LA and Austin too. I know that. I know they're definitely weren't looking at new studios for Austin. The people I know in Austin have said that they have way too many people working in Austin and not enough space. And the studio, anyone who's been to the Austin studio knows that the Austin studio is the second floor of a small two-story building. And it used to be the large section of the second floor. Now it's the entire second floor. Since I've last been there, they have increased the entire second floor. I wouldn't be surprised if they went down to the first floor, but I think the first floor is like a gym. Uh, so they may not be able to do that. They really need a new studio. And the only reason why they were in uh, B Cave, which is where they are now, is because I believe the, when they originally purchased it, it was close to some of the producers or like the studio manager's homes. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they purchased a new studio and put it in either Round Rock, North Austin, or South in like Buda or Kyle, because those places have a little bit easier... But like, you know, they may be east or west, but I doubt they'll stay in B Cave. But yeah, it, it's it's I if I remember correctly, there's like four or five different things. There's like a gym. There's like a doctor's office. Um, there's definitely a bistro. There's definitely a bistro down there. Yeah. And I've also been to L.A. too. L.A. is is like a small converted warehouse. Is what it is. Okay, anyways, off track. Let's continue to talk about this. Uh, in 2022, we will continue to grow the departments, increasing our headcount to approximately 400 or 840 and bring us closer to the release of Squadron Sources and Squadron 42. One challenge we've been facing is that we have nowhere near enough room in several of our studios for new hires that have joined us during the pandemic. Because of this, we signed long-term uh, leases on two offices in brand new and uh, state-of-the-art buildings in Manchester and Frankfurt last year. We are now only months away from opening the two new offices, both of which will create world-class collaboration spaces and house our ever-growing team. God, corporate buzz. <laughs> I mean, it's corporate buzz. I get it. I'm sure he believes it, but it's corporate buzz. I can't handle that. Um, it looks cool, though. Our new studio in the UK will deliver 90,000 square feet of state-of-the-art creative studio space over the top three floors of Manchester's Good Yards, Manchester Goods Yard. 
as well as two stages in the adjacent Manchester Studios and Bonded Warehouse Complex. A dedicated motion slash performance capture, 4,500 foot square, foot square foot stages with a suite of changing rooms, a green room, machine room, scanning room, and a viewing gallery along with smaller stage for global video production, which will have a dedicated set and be will set up for filming with uh, a, va a vast array of content for Star Citizen and later Squadron 42's launch. All right, I'm gonna explain why this is big from a lore perspective, a story perspective. For those of you who don't know, the current lore is often drip fed to us through articles which are effectively transcripts of television shows in the verse. I've always thought that Sure Shot and uh, Crossfire and the various, um, you know, radio or audio and visual shows that we were seeing the lore from was never just going to be in digital like text form that we were going to get them in some sort of interactive media or some sort of media that we could play in game. That was very obvious from the very beginning of the des design. But obviously they didn't have full context of being able to do that. This means they could do that pretty frequently. Not necessarily every day or every week, but I wouldn't be surprised if every quarter patch they have some new content for lore that they put in for interactions in the game. This, for those of you who don't know, I, I'm a theater miner. I don't have a ton of experience recently with theater, but I know Buster does, and she would definitely tell you the same thing. Renting a theater is expensive. It takes time. It takes energy. It takes manpower. Um, you, you, the time is very valuable in a theater like that. They didn't just rent a theater. They own two. One, which is a dedicated studio for, for Disco Lando, for Jared. That's why Jared moved to the Man to Manchester because they have a dedicated media studio for Jared. For those of you who don't know, his previous studio was a garage. I've been in that garage. It is big, but it's a garage. <laughs> That's a huge difference. Um, plus a mocap studio dedicated like that. It's insane. That's nuts. That's, that's a huge studio for what they have. So that, that's big for those of you like me who like lore. It means that we're going to see more lore, the more interactive stuff in game. It also means that they're going to have a much higher turnaround time for... Um, for production. One of the things that I recently saw, because I talked a lot about in my last Lore Citizen podcast, I talked about my uh, my uh, very real sexual attraction to <laughs> um, to Cal, Cal um, Mason. Um, and, and the actor is a fantastic actor. He does a lot of cool stuff. Uh, but he actually had an interview. Someone pointed me that there was an interview where he talked about his time in Squadron 42. Um, I forgot his name. Uh, it was like Houston, I think, like Frank Houston or something like that, uh, where he was like on at a release of something like like I think Pride and Prejudice for Zombies was Zombies, and they they talked about it and he talked about his time uh, filming for Squadron, and the thing that he said was impressive was they have live feedback, meaning they do a full like scene and then they can uh, stop, go and look at the full scene that they just did, blocked out in like temporary animations that's done live. And that's something that's been happening with the engine for a while. That was like in 2015. So that technology can only have gotten better. So having live feedback from something like that instantly with a studio dedicated to that, you don't do that unless you're planning on adding some serious stuff some serious immersive and or story points that you want to play out in the verse. So that's that's why that's kind of important to point out. Any hot rods in that garage? No, there was no there's no cars in that garage. It was just all storage space. <laughs> I 
I'm sexually attracted to Ryan and right, right, Henry Cavill. He can come and share my bunk and stand at any time. I'm with you there. <laughs> Um. All right. In Frankfurt, we will be moving to a 3,000 square foot over two floors at the one with the spectacular views high above the city skyline, which will is double our current space in Frankfurt and should situate us well for near-term growth there. We're also looking at the next location for our Austin studio for a potential move-in later late this year as we need more space there as well. And after that, we'll look 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 to upgrade the LA studio too. We are building long-term homes that will provide the facilities to keep the universe alive and expanding for decades to come. Um, another thing that I kind of forgot about that's important to note about this, I've heard some big media heads, and for those of you who are Star Citizen fans, this is nothing, this is just noise. But for those who are maybe newer to the verse, you've probably heard that there's some people who have been saying that they think that Chris Roberts is just going to uh, sell Scar uh, start, you know, CIG to some other big studio and bail and then blame the big studio when it fails. And while that sounds like similar to what Chris did with um, Digital Anvil and Microsoft, from what I gathered was more that Chris was way over budget and over time and they kept telling him, you just got to release it. And he kept telling them to go fly a kite. And eventually they just pulled him out because he was non-responsive. And then they just released what they could. And even then, Freelancer is a good game. <laughs> like, it's not a bad game. It's it's just wasn't fully, you know, what it could have been. Um, so I get that if you if that's your experience with Chris Roberts, that's what you get. But you don't build and buy these sorts of studios if you're planning to cut and run. It's just not what you do. Because that would, not only would that ruin your reputation in the first place, this would just decimate his reputation and the game forever. It's not something you want you to do. This is the kind of thing you would do if you were planning on releasing multiple games, which they've obviously, obviously said before, and continuing to build the game much longer into the future. These are all good signs. Uh, and again, probably not a lot of people doing summaries will probably go over that because it's either da or they just kind of don't assume it. So it's important to kind of go through all of this. All right, let's look through some of the Frankfurt Studios pictures just so you can get an idea. These are all digital mock-ups, I think. Not uh, actually... Does that say Bar Citizen in it? This is Bar Citizen, yeah. <laughs> and this is the actual one building. There. The interior. This is an interior shot. Here we go. Interior shots. Solid German. That's very German. <laughs> and then get back to the stuff. All right. And then you see the um, Manchester studio. This is the one you keep seeing in the background of, of, uh, of um, Star Citizen Live or ISC. You can see they're, they're probably closer to being built than the Frankfurt studio is. They seem to have a lot more stuff interior done. Then you go into... This is the digital mock-ups of what they should look like. Mobile class 2. That is obviously built... Please make your elevators work better in, in real life than in the game. <laughs> uh, all right. Grim Hex. Seattle Communications. Okay. Just kind of give you an idea. Uh, funny thing, so now they're building stars in real life. Look, look up any of the um, off the LA studio. The LA studio has literally the doors from the constellation as its front door. <laughs> Pretty cool. I've been there twice now. God, I've been to a lot of these places. All right. With that all being said, let's get back to this whole thing. I'm sorry for all these side tangents. Please bear with me for those of you who are watching this and recording later. This is a lot of content, and I do want to still kind of 
pair, pair, pair through it. So I understand if it took you a while to get through it. So we're already looking at an hour, 15 minutes, and I'm not even done. All right, Citizen Con shows, uh, shows such as Citizen Con are a huge undertaking and that require lots of planning. And although life is slowly returning to normal, restrictions are only now just lifting. As cases are still largely unpredictable, we see that planning big shows may still be a bit premature. The uncertainty surrounding um, resumed normality has impacted our ability to plan physical show. Traditionally, we would already be deep into planning and execution for CitizenCon today if we were going to hold an event in October. However, we have not been able to do so yet. It does seem that many of our peers in the industry are encouraging similar conundrums, are experiencing encountering similar conundrums, as E3 only recently canceled their physical show. In addition, Los Angeles, where we would hold this year's show, tends to be very cautious and more apt to impose restrictions on large in-person gatherings in the event of a new variant popping up. Because of this, combined with a large amount, a huge amount of work the company is trying to deliver this year, not to mention moving 70% of the company into two new offices, we have decided to hold, um, decided not to hold a physical citizen con this year. We will much we very much hope that next year we will be able to commit to an in-person event as we miss the opportunity to mix in person with all of you and be invigorated by your enthusiasm and excitement. At the same time, though, <clears throat> we know we could not have come this far without our community. We, will be, uh, we are grateful each and every one of you um, that has supported us along this journey. It being our 10th anniversary as a company and our community, we are going to be celebrating virtually with a virtual citizen con like we did last year. Here's the important part. One difference to last year is that there will be no keynote gameplay demo to headline this event, as this would pull valuable resources away from our game development teams that are working towards persistent streaming, Gen 12 slash Vulcan, and server meshing in your hands. Not to mention, also delivering more of the content and gameplay that has proven so successful in bringing in new players and retiring Retiring, retiring, we're going to retire old players. Um, <laughs> retaining all the new users alike. Instead, Citizen Con will be celebra a celebration of you, the community, all. With presentations and panels from our developers to share with you the progress we are making in the, uh, in the near future of what we can expect from Star Citizen in the year ahead. And as I noted back in my December 2020 letter, we are still going to be quiet on Squadron 42 until it's time to start the release campaign. And we are not quite there yet. Know that progress is coming along nicely, but we're not quite ready to pull the curtain back on Squadron just yet. This is the other big thing. This is why I said read the whole thing, because there's like 17 things in here that are like kind of big pullouts. Plus, I'm probably glossing over some that some people will point out in the comments. I said this before the recording, but I'll say this again. I made a tweet because I read this that said, I do not predict Squadron 42 coming out until 2025 at the earliest. And uh, anyone who says otherwise is setting themselves up for disappointment. For those of you who have been watching, I have been pretty consistent saying I thought that Squadron 42 was going to come out in 2023 with more expectations for CitizenCon that if we, what we see at CitizenCon will help us understand more of what was planned on happening. Now that we know that Squadron 42 is not getting released, and they said at the very beginning, to start the release of the campaign. When they say the release campaign, they don't mean the game campaign, they mean the marketing. For those of you who don't know me, I come from a marketing family. My Both my mom and my dad worked in for marketing. They, they My mom owned a independent marketing studio. My dad worked for with a partner for a marketing studio. And I've worked as a uh, effectively a brand manager and as an assistant for them off and on for, especially when I was younger, for five, five six years. So I have a lot of crash course hands-on experience. Plus working as a streamer, I work very closely with marketing teams for various games over the last five years. So when I say I have some experience in this, I have some experience in this. And Chris has already said that they plan on doing a year-long marketing campaign before the game releases. So, let me walk you through this. Squadron 42 is looking like it's getting close to being finished. Probably within the next two years. Probably by the end of 2023. 
but being done and being released are two different things. So it's obvious that it's not quite ready for that sort of planning stage. Now, they are not going to just drop a release at any time. I don't care who you are. You would be insane to just randomly drop a, a, a start a, a release campaign in February 7th, 2023. No one would do that. That is dumb. That is irresponsible. That is a waste of money. What you do is you wait for a major event where most of your fans or your, your clients are going to already be paying attention. An E3, a CitizenCon, an Invictus, an IAE, some other major event. I can guarantee you they will start around that time. So the earliest we should see a, the beginning of this campaign, which will take a year, is spring of 2023. Which means that the earliest release we will see is spring of 2024. However, this being Chris Roberts and CIG, and because so much is riding on Squadron 42, they are not, probably not going to just, because the marketing is, says it's released, it's going to be released. I wouldn't be surprised if we see a slip of three to six months. Simply because things happen, you need to make sure it's good. So, with a three to six month slip, with the earliest being spring of 2024, I would say that that gives us to the end of 2024, more reasonably spring or summer of 2025. From a marketing perspective, and anyone who says, well, just release the game, you're an idiot. That's not how games are made. That's not how you make money. That's not how it works. You need to have time to market because the people who will buy this game are different from you or me. They're people who don't follow the game. They're people who just casually watch. Those are the people you want to grab in because they're Mark Hamill fans, because they like John Rice Davies, because they have an entire wall of Henry Cavill pictures. Those are the people you want to come and buy the game and play it, because those are the people who don't know about it yet. And those are the people you can convert into Star Citizen fans if they realize there's an MMO based off of this same single player game. So, I'm sorry to say, Squadron is three years away. Before I see anybody in the comments being like, ha, Squadron 42 is two years away. No, three years away. <laughs> Suck it. <laughs> Let's move back to it, though. Uh, Twitch will be a huge marketing tool for Sagi. Yes, YouTube and Twitch, both. Uh, Bar Citizen World Tour. All right, here we go. It has been more than two years since we've had the opportunity to spend time with all of you in person. And while we will, no, will not be together for CitizenCon, we cannot hold uh, uh, out another year. For that reason, we plan to kick off a robust Bar Citizen World Tour this summer. Uh, perfectly coinciding with an in lore holiday, first contact day. Definitely read up on the backstory to see what if, if it fits so nicely. Oh, because the Banu like to drink. <laughs> the Banu like to party, man. The Banu fucking party. So yes, um, yeah, it's it's pretty cool. I'll have to look in there, and we'll we'll talk about there afterwards. Hey, Jake, now you're here. <laughs> um, I'll make the announcement at the end of this this thing as well, Jake. Thank you for coming in. Um, we will also, would also like to take this perfect opportunity to coin a new out-of-game annual holiday, International Bar Citizen Day. We will celebrate this inaugural new holiday by hosting Bar Citizen events simultaneously near our development studios in mid-June, which I'll be there. If you're in Austin, I will be there. Uh, details on the when slash where coming very soon. After that, we plan on to branch out and bring the fun events that may not be as close to our studios. Our company, our community team is planning on to embrace bar citizens around the globe with reward, uh, with renewed vigor, bringing goodies and with uh, and developers with them to meet and mingle with all of you as part of the celebration for our 10th anniversary. Keep a close eye on Spectrum in the weeks to come as the team will be, will be, bring, will being, will be, begin, uh, English, exploring which bar citizen events to attend. So if you're hosting your own event, we want to hear from you. There you go. All right. Final thoughts. Only an hour and a half. 
While some of you will no doubt be disappointed to hear that the news about no physical show and no keynote demo for CitizenCon, the team and I felt it was much more important that we focus on making development progress so that we could maintain the pace of delivery that we have been hitting since Alpha 314. This year is a big one for all of us on Star Citizen. You can expect to see Invictus Launch Week moving into the clouds of Crusader, the promise of persistent entity streaming making its way into the verse, as well as big game-changing features like salvage, persistent physicalized cargo, bounty hunting v2, new events and missions, enhancements to jump town, features like our um, ships. Uh, I know you're waiting on like the Corsair, Vulture, and Whole Sea, as well as more quality of life and new player onboarding improvements to make Star Citizen even more playable and welcoming than it is today. And without mentioning pyro and server meshing, and, and that is without mentioning pyro and server meshing, which we are aggressively working towards letting you test by the end of the year, um, pending on how difficult it is to get persistent energy streaming stable. We think you would all rather be playing this new content than hearing about it. So we will use our time this year to focus on development and delivering you the tech features and content you are waiting for. I'm going to say this, which is going to sound a little controversial, but I've been waiting to say this for three years. Thank you, Chris. I've always felt that CitizenCon is a bit, it's nice, but it's always a bit indulgent. And I would much rather the resources be put more towards the development to get things done and to wait for the big celebrations and to the, the slap on the backs and more information with, especially meeting with the developers once there are more content that we can, that they can show off and they can feel proud to have done. I think that everyone would be happier. Than that. And I think this is a good move for that. <clears throat> The developers at CIG tend to get a lot of attention, which is well-deserved as most of our talented development team I've ever worked with. But there are a lot more people beyond development at CIG. As they say, it takes a village. Without publishing and live ops team, the servers would not be 24-7 in the cloud, and you would not be able to download or play Star Citizen. Without quality assurance team, tireless testing, and feedback, Star Citizen would be unplayable. Without backend web teams as turbulent, you would uh, would not be able to, to, to log on, have a website to, to read news and information, or a forum to participate in healthy debate or, um, on pledge or launch Star Citizen. I see there's no lore mentions there, Chris. Uh, without our studio experience team, uh, after the health of our um, organization, there would be it would not be creative environment as ambitious as Star Citizen. Uh, uh, well, let's see this. But our studio experience team, looking after the health of our organization, there would be there would not be a creative environment as ambitious as Star Citizen. Without our finance and legal teams, we could not have built the company unique and groundbreaking as CIG. Without our marketing and community teams, there would not be any communication about their plans, no dazzling trailers to the tease and excite from future combat the content, and no real back and forth between community and CIG. Without customer support and player experience teams, there would not be help the need they <laughs> you would not get the help you need, nor have the ability to give feedback on gameplay in a way that can be quantified. Without our IT department, we would not be able to work together. Um, whether whether in the office or from home, nor would we be able to compile code or create beautiful assets without our people department. Our people department? Is that HR now? There would be nobody here to hire, listen, and <laughs> and guide to help us. That seems very weird, sanitized. And without all of you, with your enthusiasm and patience, we would no be no Star Citizen, Squad 42, or Cloud Imperium games. As we move closer to achieving the critical milestones outlined above, we cannot help but feel the immense amount of appreciation for each and every one of you who shares in the collective dream of Star Citizen. The path ahead is more vibrant than ever, but in some ways, the collective journey together, uh, the mo moments and fun that people have along the way as we build Star Citizen together is as rewarding as the ultimate destination. <clears throat> and that is what makes the game and community special. From all of us at Cloud Imperium, we'll see you at Bar Citizen, Digital Citizens Con, the PTU. That's actually pretty good. I've read it. It's like the third or fourth time I've read it. And I'm glad that this is letter. I will say it's still an essay. It's an hour and a half to read through it and, you know, piece part of it and kind of talk a little bit about it. But I will give you as much of a summary as I can. The quick and dirty. A lot of things got delayed because of COVID. They still got a lot of stuff done. But there are three major milestones they have to complete. Persistence, Gen 12, and server meshing. Persistence and Gen 12 are coming out in 318, but because y'all are maniacs, I mean, I'm a maniac, 
and I like to dump, I'm sorry, I am Vader is a maniac and likes to collect bodies and dump them in the middle of a town, Times Square because it's for a meme. Um, we're gonna, it's gonna, they're gonna take three months to really flush out 318. So it might release to PTU or Evocati this summer, but it won't be released until the fall. Um, but in the meantime, you'll get a 317.2 with more content and other things like that. Once that's released, then depending on how stable it is, they'll move on to the next patch, which will be server meshing. But again, based off of what's uh, how much problems that P the PES can cause, the persistence persistent can cause, it may delay it further. And their tentative goal is to release that to live in uh, pretty much Q1 of 2023. So around when we got 317. So eight March, April of 2017 for server meshing for everyone. Now, because of that, CitizenCon is going to be digital because of COVID, but also because they don't want to have a, a big um, <clears throat> presentation. There's not going to be any discussions on Squadron this year, not yet. And um, they're, they are going to do bar citizens around the world. They're building two new studios, which are going to be open in the next couple of months in Manchester and Frankfurt, which is going to have a lot of people. They have almost a thousand people working for them right now. And uh, the, everything's kind of plugging away and moving forward. That is the quick and dirty of it. There's a lot more I've, I've kind of glossed over, including that the Manchester studio has its own uh, two dedicated theaters. <laughs> yeah, like, hopefully you watch the whole video. I'll say this. Thank you for watching this. If you've watched this to the very end, I want to thank you for sticking with me as long as you have. This channel has grown significantly over the last year. We've had more people engaged and involved. I hired a new editor from the community. He's a member of the community who's an editor. I hired them to help me with Galactic Historian and I have like something like 300 something dollars just coming through Patreon alone, which has helped me a lot because I can pay them money. I'd like to pay them more money. So if you want to help me on a Patreon, you can. I am also going to be introducing memberships to, to YouTube, but it's mostly to um, give early access to things like um, captain's tables, or this, for instance, will go out early to members. Like as soon as my office hours is over with, I'll put it up on members only, my monthly report stuff, and then the next day it'll release for everybody else. It just is a way you can support me financially through YouTube. You don't have to support me through all those methods, they'll just be available for you, just to scatter shot. And I will say this, I will also make this announcement at the very end. If you want to join us for Captain's Table on Saturday, I have Jake Acapella, Jake Bradley from CIG, community manager from CIG, will be on Captain's Table this Saturday, along with um, Anna Dimitriou, who is a actor who has who works with Star Citizen CIG. He's also a live streamer. You've probably seen her on Twitch. Um, and she is a, an actor who's worked, she, is, she plays the... Um, AI assistant lady in uh, New Babbage, and she is the uh, voice of um, Dooley in uh, uh, for CDF for Xenothreat. So come join us there Saturday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern for that. So thank you all. Love your faces. Like I say every time. Hope to see you someday in the black.